fact that there is one million boats in Sweden, that's one boat per nine people. It's the highest number of boats per person in Europe. Being a statistician, you don't like telling your profession at dinner parties. But really, statisticians shouldn't be shy because everyone wants to understand what's going on. And statistics gives us a perspective on the world we live in that we can't get in any other way. Statistics tells us whether the things we think and believe are actually true. And statistics are far more useful than we usually like to admit. Instead of being led astray by prejudice, with statistics at our fingertips, our eyes can be open for a fact-based view of the world. So, more than ever before, we can become authors of our own destiny. We are heading towards a world of free data with all the statistical insights that come from it, accessible to everyone, empowering us as citizens and letting us hold our rulers to account. It's a long way from where statistics began. Statistics are essential to us to monitor our governments and our societies. But it was our rulers up there who started the collection of statistics in the first place in order to monitor us. In fact, the word statistics comes from the state. Modern statistics began two centuries ago. Once it got going, it spread and never stopped. And guess who was first? The Chinese have Confucius. The Italians have Da Vinci, and the British have Shakespeare. And we have the Tabellwerket, the first ever systematic collection of statistics. Since the year 1749, we have collected data on every birth, marriage, and death, and we are proud of it. The Tabellwerket recorded information from every parish in Sweden. It was a huge quantity of data, and it was the first time any government could get an accurate picture of its people. Sweden had been the greatest military power in Northern Europe. But by 1749, our star was really fading and other countries were growing stronger. At least though, we were a large power, thought to have 20 million people, enough to rival Britain and France. But we were in for a nasty surprise. The first analysis of Tabellwerket revealed that Sweden only had two million inhabitants. Sweden was not only a power in decline, it also had a very small population. The government was horrified by this finding. What if the enemy found out? But the Tabellwerket also showed that many women died in childbirth, and many children died young. So government took action to improve the health of the people. This was the beginning of modern Sweden. It took more than 50 years before the Austrians, Belgians, Danes, Dutch, French, Germans, Italians, and finally the British caught up with Sweden in collecting and using statistics. It was called political arithmetic. That was a lovely phrase that was used for statistics. Governments could have much more control and understanding of, of the society, how it was working, how it was developing, and essentially so they could control it better. It wasn't just governments who woke up to the power of statistics. Right across Europe, 
19th century society went mad for facts. And despite its late start, Britain, with its Royal Statistical Society in London, was soon a statistician's nirvana. I love looking at old copies of the Royal Statistical Society journal because it's full of such odd stuff. There's a, a wonderful paper from the 1840s which shows a map of England and the rates of bastardy in each county. And so you can identify very quickly the areas with high rates of bastardy. Being in East Anglia, it always makes me slightly laugh that Norfolk seems to top the bastardy league in the 1840s. One of the founders of the Royal Statistical Society was the great Victorian mathematician and inventor, Charles Babbage. In 1842, he read the latest poem by an equally great Victorian, Alfred Tennyson. Vision of Sin contained the lines, Fill the cup and fill the can, have a rouse before the morn. Every moment dies a man, every moment one is born. So keen a statistician was Babbage that he could not contain himself. He dashed off a letter to Tennyson explaining that because of population growth, the line should read, every moment dies a man and one and a sixteenth is born. I may add that the exact figure is 1.067, but something must be conceded to the laws of meter. In the 19th century, scholars all over Europe did amazing work in measuring their societies. They were hoovering up data on almost everything. But numbers alone don't tell you anything. You have to analyze them. And that's what makes statistics. When the first statisticians began to get to grips with analyzing their data, they seized upon the average, and they took the average of everything. What's so great about an average is that you can take a whole mass of data and reduce it to a single number. And though each of us is unique, our collective lives produce averages that can characterize whole populations. I looked in my local newspaper one week and saw a pensioner had accidentally put her foot on the accelerator and crushed her friend against a wall. Devastating, hideous, horrible thing to happen. And then there was a second one about a young man who didn't have a driving license, was driving a car under the influence of drugs and alcohol, and he bashed into a pedestrian. What's remarkable, absolutely remarkable, if you look at the number of people who die each year in traffic crashes, it's nearly a constant. What? All these individual events, somehow when you sum them all up, there's the same number every year. And every year, two and a half times as many men die in traffic crashes as women, and it's a constant. And every year, the rate in Belgium is double the rate in England. There are these remarkable regularities. So that these individual particular events sum up, sum up into a social phenomenon. Let's look again at the number of adult women in Sweden for different heights. Plotting the data as a shape shows how much their heights vary from the average and how wide that variation is. The shape a set of data makes is called its distribution. The statisticians who first explored distribution discovered one shape that turned up again and again. The Victorian scholar Francis Galton was so fascinated, he built a machine that could reproduce it and he found it fitted so many different sets of measurements that he named it the normal distribution. Whether it was people's arm spans, lung capacities, 
or even their exam results, the normal distribution shape recurred time and time again. Other statisticians soon found many other regular shapes, each produced by a particular kind of natural or social processes. And every statistician has their favorite. The Poisson distribution, the Poisson shape, is, is my favorite distribution. I think it's an absolute cracker. The Poisson shape describes how likely it is that out of the ordinary things will happen. Imagine a London bus stop where we know that on average we'll get three buses an hour. We won't always get three buses, of course. Amazingly, the Poisson shape will show us the probability that in any given hour, we will get four, five, or six buses, or no buses at all. The exact shape changes with the average. But whether it's how many people will win the lottery jackpot each week, or how many people will phone a call center each minute, the Poisson shape will give the probabilities. The wonderful example where this was applied to in the late 19th century was to count each year the number of Prussian officers, cavalry officers, who were kicked to death by their horses. Now, some years there were none, some years there were one, some years there were two, up to seven, I think, one particularly bad year. Um, but with this distribution, how many years there were with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, Prussian cavalry officers kicked to death by their horses beautifully obeyed the Poisson distribution. So statisticians use shapes to reveal the patterns in the data. But we also use images of all kinds to communicate statistics to a wider public. Because if the story in the numbers is told by a beautiful and clever image, then everyone understands. Of the pioneers of statistical graphics, my favorite is Florence Nightingale. There are not many people who realize that actually she was known as a passionate statistician and not just a lady of the lamp. She said that to understand God's thoughts, we must study statistics, for these are the measure of his purpose. Statistics was for her a religious duty and moral imperative. In the mid-1850s, Florence Nightingale went to the Crimea to care for British casualties of war. She was horrified by what she discovered. For all the soldiers being blown to bits on the battlefield, there were many, many more soldiers dying from diseases they caught in the army's filthy hospitals. So Florence Nightingale began counting the dead. For two years, she recorded mortality data in meticulous detail. When the war was over, she persuaded the government to set up a royal commission of inquiry and gathered her data in a devastating report. What has cemented her place in the statistical history books are the graphics she used, and one in particular, the polar area graph. For each month of the war, a huge blue wedge represented the soldiers who had died from preventable diseases. The much smaller red wedges were deaths from wounds and the black wedges, deaths from accidents and other causes. Nightingale's graphics were so clear, they were impossible to ignore. Today, 150 years on, Nightingale's graphics are rightly regarded as a classic. They led to a revolution in nursing, healthcare, and hygiene in hospitals worldwide, which saved innumerable lives. And statistical graphics has become an art form of its very own led by designers who are passionate about visualizing data. This is the billion pound ogram. This image arose out of frustration with the reporting of billion pound amounts in the media. 500 billion pounds for this war, 50 billion pounds for this oil spill. It doesn't kind of make sense. These numbers are too enormous to get your mind around. So I scraped all this data from various news sources and created this diagram. So the squares here are scaled according to the billion pound amounts. When you see numbers 
visualized like this, you start to have a different kind of relationship with them. Um, you can start to see patterns, you can see the scale of them. Here, in the corner, this little square, 37 billion, that was the cost, the predicted cost of the Iraq war in 2003. And as you can see, it's grown exponentially over the last few years, so the total cost now is around about 2,500 billion. It's funny, because when you visualize statistics like this, you understand them, and when you understand them, you can really start to put things into perspective. The internet is just one of many technologies created to gather massive amounts of data. Scientists studying our Earth and our environment now use an incredible range of instruments to measure the processes of our planet. All around us are sensors continuously measuring temperature, water flow and ocean currents. And high in orbit are satellites busy imaging cloud formations, forest growth and snow cover. Scientists speak of instrumenting the Earth and pointing up to the skies above are powerful new telescopes mapping the universe. The vast amounts of data we have today allows researchers in all sorts of fields to test their theories on a previously unimaginable scale. But more than this, it may even change the fundamental way science is done. With the power of today's computers applied to all this data, the machines might even be able to guide the researchers. We're at a, a potentially profoundly important and potentially one of the most significant uh, uh, points in science, and certainly one of the most exciting, uh, where uh, the potential to transform not just how scientists do science, but even what science is possible, and what will power that transformation of, of how science is done, and even what science is possible, is going to be computation. Many of the dynamics of the natural world like the interplay between the rainforest and the atmosphere, are so complex that we don't as yet really understand them. But now, computers are generating literally tens of thousands of different simulations of how these biological systems might work. It's like creating thousands of hypothetical parallel worlds. Each and every one of these simulations is analyzed with statistics, to see if any are a good match for what is observed in nature. The computers can now automatically generate, test and discard hypotheses with scarcely a human inside. This new application of statistics will become uh, absolutely vital for the future of science. It's creating a new paradigm, if you like, in science and the way in which we can do science which is increasingly, which will might characterize as data-centric or data-driven rather than being hypothesis-driven or experimentally driven. Now, if all that sounds a bit abstract and theoretical to you, how about one final frontier? Could statistics even make sense of your feelings? In California, where else, one computer scientist is harvesting the internet to try to divine the patterns of our innermost thoughts and emotions. Well, this is the Madness Movement. The Madness Movement represents a skyscraper view of the world. Each of these brightly colored dots is an individual feeling expressed by someone out there in a blog or a tweet. And when you click on a dot, it explodes to reveal the underlying feeling of that person. This is what people say they're feeling today. Better, safe, crappy, 
Well. Pretty. Special. Sorry. Alone. So every minute We Feel Fine crawls the world's blogs, takes all the sentences that start with the words I feel or I am feeling, and puts them in a database. We collect all the feelings, and we count the most common. They are better, bad, good, right, guilty, sick, the same, like shit, sorry, well, and so on. And we can take a look at any one feeling and analyze it. Right now, a lot of people are feeling happy. We can take a look at all the people who are happy and break down by age, gender, or location. Since bloggers have public profiles, we have that information. And so we can ask questions like, are women happier than men? Or is England happier than the United States? We find that as people get older, they get happier. And moreover, we find that for younger people, they associate happiness more with excitement. And as people get older, they associate happiness more with peacefulness. And we also find that women feel loved more often than men, but also more guilty while men feel good more often than women, but also more alone. As people lead more and more of their lives online, they leave behind digital traces. And with these digital traces, we can begin to statistically analyze what it means to be human. Statistics are a handy tool in this age of information, useful to uncover risks and important correlations. Salesmen distort them, as do pressure groups and quacks, they're misused in the media and in political attacks. Among the lies and damned lies is a trick that takes the biscuit, the beguiling use of half-truths that's just lying with statistics. If you want an opinion poll to show that you've got ample support for your point of view, then base it on a sample of multiple respondents who have all been self-selecting with an obvious built-in bias for which there isn't any correcting. Then you'll get the answer skewed just the way you wished it, but it isn't representative, it's just lying with statistics. If you want to cause controversy, contention, fear and doubt, then why not quote some figures that no one can work out, like the number of illegal immigrants in this country at one time, or how many dangerous strangers lurk maliciously online. It's approximated guesswork however much you might insist it, so to quote it as undoubted fact is just lying with statistics. If you want to make a small effect sound like something bigger, just relate it in percentage terms to another tiny figure. A risk that's two in a million will obviously represent increasing a one in a million risk by 100%. If you tell folk that the danger's doubled, they'll just not want to risk it, but not saying that the risk's still small is just lying with statistics. If you're selling dietary supplements as health-promoting pills, with no conclusive evidence of curing any ill, there's bound to be some poorly run trial from long ago, showing up some small effect that other trials do not show. You can quote this honestly, even though you cherry-picked it, but leaving out the other trials is just lying with statistics. When meeting a statistic about which you have some doubt, ask yourself, whose claim is this? How do they work it out? Is there some crucial fact they've chosen to leave out? Has the subject changed between the stats and what the claim's about? Always check the detail and how interests try to twist it, because using numbers without context is just lying with statistics.